Hello everyone in the room and everyone online. Um, thanks for coming today to our first colloquium series of the new year. Um, and this is also our third series of our ongoing colloquium series on new work on the concepts of health and disease. Um, we have another three or four talks throughout the year or for the first term at least. So the next talk will be on January 26th with Helena Scotts Fordman. And that will again be online and in person. So please come along if you're here and would like to. Uh, details of that event can be found on both our event right page and our philosophy and medicine website. And I think Evelina will put it in the chat for those online. Uh, and before I introduce our speaker, I just want to say a quick thank you to the Sowerby Foundation for supporting today's event. Uh, and the rest of this series as well. For more info about the events, as I said, go on the project, uh, go on the website. Um, and as a quick overview of today, today's event, we're first going to hear from our speaker, Harriet, for about 45 minutes. Then we'll have a quick break in between that and the Q&A, which will last again about 45 minutes. Um, so please do reserve questions for the Q&A period. Uh, so I am delighted to introduce Dr. Harriet Fagerberg, who is a postdoctoral fellow of philosophy at Hunter College uh, and the Graduate Centre CUNY. Uh, prior to her current position, she was doing her PhD here with us at KCL, so it's a welcome back instead of a welcome to Kings. Uh, she's written on various topics in philosophy of psychiatry and medicine, and today is going to be talking to us about the domino theory of disease. So I'm going to hand over to Harriet. Thanks, Rivka. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, my name is Harriet. Um, some of you maybe know me from before because I was here doing my PhD and also actually worked for the Salvi project. So it's good to be back. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to talk about today is, is, is you know, what I call like a domino theory of disease. Um, it's basically what I think pathological conditions or diseases are. Um, and um, yeah, I hope you're all super convinced by it. Um, so this is the plan for today. So firstly, I'm going to uh, give you kind of a brief note on sort of methodology or how I am approaching this question. Um, then I'm going to outline a kind of a view which sort of is in the literature already, which is the view that uh, diseases are biological dysfunctions. Um, then I'm going to give you kind of the basic spiel of what the domino theory says and hopefully get you on board. Uh, and then I'm going to flesh it out with the uh, with a lot of detail and sort of try to make it convincing. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to discuss some, some implications of um, the view. Okay, so first uh, method. So um, as you'll know, if you've been following this colloquium already, um, there's something in philosophy of medicine, which is sort of known as the disease debate. Um, it's uh, the debate as to what disease kind of is. And usually it's understood very broadly. So um, encompassing things like pathology or disorder uh, or even mental disorder. Um, you know, one problem with this debate is that it's, there's at least kind of three ways of understanding what that question uh, means or how we should go about answering that question methodologically speaking. Um, so you might, for example, think that it means, you know, what do people, for example, medical doctors, laymen, uh, psychiatrists have in mind when they're judging some condition or person to be diseased or pathological? So that would be kind of something like what we know in philosophy, like as, as, as conceptual analysis. Alternatively, we could, it could mean like, how should we think of disease in order to serve legitimate, ethical, political, pragmatic, or scientific aims, uh, which would be a version of what uh, is known as conceptual engineering. Um, uh, and thirdly, you might think it means what is the sort of underlying property or causal structure which characterizes the real kind um, pathology or disease in the world, which would be something like what Milligan calls the real definition. So um, what I'm I'm trying to get at here is the, is the third question. So I'm not interested in what people have in mind when they um, you know, judge something to be pathological, and I'm not really interested in how we should think of it per se. So I'm, I'm, I'm only kind of interested in um, what the nature of the kind is. Um, and, um, you know, so you, you might note, okay, well, this, this is a really strong assumption in the background here, right, that pathology is a real kind or a natural kind. I'm not going to argue for that today, but I do have a kind of argument for it. So, you know, like, um, if anyone's interested in that, uh, we can talk more about it later. Okay, um, so uh, one view that features in the literature, and which is also the starting point for me, uh, is the view that, um, that pathological conditions are biological dysfunctions. 
what is a biological dysfunction? Well, a sort of simple version of this view, um, you know, it's 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 people like Jerome Wakefield or uh, Christopher Bors are sort of known uh, as the people who um, defend this view in the literature. But a sort of simple version of it might be said to state that a pathological condition is a failure of some trait, biological trait, to yield its biological function, um, and that a biological function is an effect um, for which that trait was naturally selected. So, uh, for example, you might think that uh, it's pathological um, for the heart to fail to beat or fail to pump blood, because that is the effect for which hearts were selected um, in the evolutionary history. So that's a, that's a very sort of simple picture. And it's, I think it's an attractive picture. I think it's a, it's a sort of, you know, it, it has a lot of, um, you know, uh, it's very sort of um, well theoretically grounded and, you know, it's, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you might also think that you know this dysfunction talk features quite prominently in the empirical sciences, right? People talk about dysfunction and disease almost uh, interchangeably. Um, so I'm I'm inclined to sort of accept this view. However, there are some cases or some sort of instances of biological dysfunction that potentially cause some problems for someone who wants to defend a dysfunction account. So, for example, a single dysfunctional kidney, right? So. People can live a kind of seemingly healthy life with just one kidney. You don't need two kidneys to sort of, um, you know, avoid pathology, you might think. Um, similarly, you might think, you know, we all have, have uh, various sort of, you know, we're all probably instantiating like dysfunction at some cellular level all the time. You know, there's probably some cells in our body that are not functioning as they should. Um, that seems like it would be a dysfunction, but it's not clear that that would be pathological. Um, Similarly, and this is this has been a big kind of issue in the disease debate. Um, and I'm not going to say that these are dysfunctions, but you might think that um, it could be the case that some uh, sort of um, some sexual orientations are biological dysfunctions, that they are failures of some mechanism to yield a kind of um, uh, to yield sort of same sex attraction, sorry, opposite sex attraction. So, for example, asexuality or exclusive same sex attraction could be a biological dysfunction. If it's a biological dysfunction, then it looks like uh, someone who defends a dysfunction account would have to say it's pathological. And this is, people like Christopher Bolt have actually said that, you know, if it's a dysfunction, it's a disease on his view. Um, uh, similarly, like contraception, right? So we all, you know, lots of people use contraception. Lots of um, women are permanently unable to have children <laughs> by, by, you know, by choice. Um, and it doesn't seem that that's the case where we're inflicting pathology upon ourselves, right? Um, so these cases seem a bit weird and they cause, you know, I think uh, sort of should motivate some doubt about the, the dysfunction account. Um, so for example, the way that this has been dealt with in the literature so far is mostly by saying, okay, well then, you know, there's, there's got to be like a, a big role for evaluative harm, right? There must be something, uh, something else going on with disease. Um, so for example, Rachel Cooper says that if homosexuality turned out to be caused by a biological dysfunction, this would force naturalists, people who think that um, diseases are dysfunctions, to consider it a disorder. Those who adopt a value laden account of disorder take a different line. For them, biological dysfunction is not sufficient for disorder, and insofar as it is agreed that there is no harm, homosexuality cannot be a disorder. Similarly, and very influentially, Jerome Wakefield um, argues that uh, pathological dysfunctions are dysfunctions which also cause some harm or deprivation of benefit to the person as judged by the standards of the person's culture. Um, so he considers, for example, that even in his original work, he considers the, the sort of kidney case and he says, to be considered a disorder, the dysfunction must also cause significant harm to the person under present environmental circumstances and according to present cultural standards. For example, a dysfunction in one kidney often has no effect on the overall well-being of a person, and so it's not considered to be a disorder. Physicians will remove a kidney from a live donor for transplant purposes with no sense that they're causing a disorder, even though people certainly are naturally designed to have two kidneys. Um, so it looks like this is a problem that you know exists in the literature already. Um, I'm not a fan of the sort of harm criterion thing for various reasons. Um, one thing you might worry about is that it has the, the effect of making it a kind of value relative matter whether a dysfunction constitutes pathology in these disputed cases. So for example, if I have only one kidney and my culture judges that I suffer a harm or deprivation of benefit, does that transform it from a mere dysfunction to a pathological condition? You, I, I would think not. Um, so the, the sort of, the sort of um, hypothesis, I guess, that um, I'm uh, 
sort of um, investigating here is that these are not cases of pathology kind of regardless of any considerations about harm, that there's some kind of other difference between these cases and the pathological cases of dysfunction. So yeah, so what do these cases have in common other than the absence of harm? Okay, so um, this is the basic spiel, right? So um, the hypothesis that I'm working with is that, uh, you know, pathological uh, dysfunctions are not pathological because of how we evaluate them. Rather, they are pathological because they are a special kind of biological dysfunction, uh, which I call domino dysfunctions. So domino dysfunctions are dysfunctions in traits which are tightly embedded into the functional hierarchy of the rest of the body in such a way that other traits depend on them for their normal function. Um, when a trait is situated within the body in that sense, um, and it fails, you know, a lot of dependent traits that sort of needed that trait to function normally will start acting up as well and will become um, either dysfunctional or, um, as I call it, sort of mismatched relative to the somatic environment. Um, so um, this sort of view is kind of motivated by just the observation that there is this very, um, there is this very intricate kind of dependence relation between uh, environmental conditions and evolved things in general, right? So for example, um, biological traits depend on their external environment for certain things in their external environment for them to operate normally, for them to be able to perform their functions. So for example, um, my eyes, me, I cannot see in an environment with no light. Um, or if there's no oxygen in your environment, your internal organs will very quickly become dysfunctional. So you're dependent on all these factors in the environment for <clears throat> normal function. Um, this is what people call like, you know, um, people call it a selective environment. So the selective environment is sort of the environment that you need in order for your uh, traits to perform their functions. Um, and it seems to me the same is true inside the body. So biological traits are evolved to uh, perform their functions in the context of all the other traits that are performing their functions within the body. Um, and you might think of that as a somatic selective environment. Um, and given that this is the case, when there's a problem in the somatic environment, when some uh, trait becomes dysfunctional and it's not operating as, as uh, the other traits would expect it to operate, as they are designed to, to um, expect it to operate, that, that dysfunction often reverberates throughout the body um, and, and causes problems for, for a range of other traits as well. And, and my theory is that this is what, this is what makes a dysfunction pathological, not, um, not simply the fact that it's a dysfunction. So one way to think of this is in terms of um, people who kind of know the functional literature is, is uh, one way to think of this is in terms of like functional analysis. Um, so <clears throat> this is Neander in 1995. She observes that in physiology, the human organism is decomposed into major systems, digestive, circulatory, respiratory, reproductive, and so on. And the contribution made by each of these systems to the functioning of the whole is described. And then it's decomposed into smaller and smaller parts down to the cellular level, right? And at all levels, there are these these dependence relations, right? Where um, at a higher level, um, the functioning there is completely dependent on the functioning of the lower level parts. So um, here's a sort of rough uh, breakdown of um, the, the a functional analysis of the heart, right? So the heart pumps that contributes to moving blood around the body, um, which uh, contributes to transporting oxygen to tissues, which in turn contributes to normal cognitive functions. You see that these dependence relations um, across the levels. So you might think that if the heart's not pumping, right, that's gonna be a problem uh, that's gonna reverberate throughout all the other levels of the analysis. Okay, so at this point, I just wanna sort of briefly revisit the problem cases that I mentioned at the beginning and see you know, whether this sort of distinction is useful for making sense of them. Um, and I think I think it is. So I think the problem cases that have sort of cropped up in the disease debate historically um, have been cases that that fail to conform to this picture, the picture of dominant dysfunctions. You know, they're, they're, they're dysfunctions. That's fine. But they're not dominant dysfunctions. So for example, a single dysfunctional kidney um, fails to cause any kind of disruption in other traits. Right. That's what we mean when we say, oh, if, as, you know, living with one kidney, you can be healthy with one kidney. It's because there it will be no sort of, you know, there will be no domino effects or sort of reverberations throughout the body of that single dysfunctional kidney. Similarly, like one dead neuron or cell, um, as long as there are enough functioning cells, 
that's gonna, not going to cause any problems in in other traits, right? So it doesn't seem to have this sort of compounding uh, domino effect. Um, asexuality or exclusive same-sex attraction or any other kind of evolutionarily prima facie postling sexual orientations don't seem to have any effects on any other traits at all, right? So, so it's not clear how that could be um, a dominant dysfunction. Doesn't seem to conform to this picture. Similarly, um, contraception uh, or voluntary sterilization, the dysfunction there seems to be entirely isolated to the reproductive system. It's not the case that, for example, your digestive system or you know um, your brain or any other big systems of the body like depend on reproductive function for their functioning. Right? It seems to be kind of isolated in this special way. Um, so um, I call these sort of dysfunctions trivial dysfunctions as opposed to dominant dysfunctions. Um, and it seems to me we have the beginnings here of like a principal distinction between um, these sort of, you know, non-pathological trivial dysfunctions on the one hand and um, pathological dysfunctions on the other. And I think, I think that's kind of what we need. We need some kind of reason to say, um, you know, to show that these, these are different in principle, right? This is not just a case of like how we value things. Okay, so in sum, this is basically uh, what I think. I think it's an overlooked fact that most biological dysfunctions are not just biological dysfunctions. They're also due to these intricate evolved dependence relations, causes of failure of normal function and other traits of the body. And I think that's something that hasn't really been brought up in the, in the debate so far. Um, but it's also the case that not all traits are equally functionally integrated or interdependent with other bodily traits. And so not all dysfunctions have the relevant kinds of domino effects. So this, this seems to imply a distinction between two kinds of dysfunctions. So we have domino dysfunctions, which are pathological, and then we have trivial non-pathological dysfunctions, which don't have those kinds of, um, those kinds of reverberating effects. Okay, um, yeah. So um, I'm kind of hoping at this point that you're like, you, you kind of kind of see the distinction and you think it sounds, you know, uh, prima facie like a good idea, um, because now I'm going to try to flesh out the details and it gets a bit more complicated. <laughs> um, okay, so basically this is the picture we have, right? So we have trivial dysfunctions, which are, um, on my view, biological dysfunctions, which neither cause other traits of the body to become somatically mismatched, uh, nor cause other traits of the organism's body to become dysfunctional. Um, and then we have domino dysfunctions, on the other hand, which are biological dysfunctions, which either cause other traits of the body to become somatically mismatched or cause other traits of the organism's body to become dysfunctional or both. Um, so this is still a bit vague, right? Like it's, we still don't have a full account of, um, of the sort of uh, concepts that make up this, uh, this theory. So I think what we need to get a story fully straight and um, you know, explicated sufficiently is a precise account of dysfunction um, a precise account of somatic mismatches, and also um, a sense of the sorts of dependence relations which are relevant in these cases, like which what kinds of dependence relations are we talking about between traits? Okay, so biological dysfunction. Um, the view of biological dysfunction that I have in mind is basically this. Um, and in order to understand what this means, you kind of need to have a handle on the notion of approximate function. Um, so we talked about the functional analysis um, uh, sort of uh, already, right? That like, you know, um, traits do lots of things, right? They contribute to, for example, the heart, it pumps, it contributes to blood circulation, it contributes to supplying oxygen to tissues. Um, but one of those functions is more specific to the heart than the others, right? For example, blood circulation involves a much larger system. You know, there's, there's, um, there's a lot else that needs to kind of be performing its function in order for the heart to, um, to have the effects um, of circulating blood. Um, so the, the most proximate function is really like the, the function that is at the base of the functional analysis. So in the case of the heart, it's the, it's the heart um, pumps blood. Um, and um, the view that I take is that <clears throat> you can't have a, a dysfunction without a failure of approximate function. So <clears throat> a biological function is the failure in ability of some trait T to perform its most proximate biological function. Uh, for reasons of internal constitution. Um, and um, because this is quite a narrow view of what dysfunction is, uh, it looks like there's, uh, it leaves room for, for a lot of kind of problems that might occur with the traits functioning um, that does not rise to the level of being a dysfunction. So for example, um, 
or particular environmental mismatches, right? So uh, this particular definition of biological dysfunction kind of implies two ways in which a trait might be operating strangely or not ideally, um, whilst still not being dysfunctional. So it could be that the trait is performing its most proximate function, but that something else is going wrong. Um, or it could be that it's um, failing to perform its proximate function, but not for reasons of internal constitution. If so, then T is not dysfunctional, the trait is not dysfunctional. However, it may be mismatched relative to its environment. So for example, in an environment with no water, my lungs cannot perform their function in breathing, but they are not dysfunctional yet. The problem is that they lack one of the environmental predispositions for performing their, um, their uh, approximate function. Um, it's also the case that mismatches, even though they're not dysfunctions, they can be causes of dysfunction. So think about, um, you know, a fish out of water, right? Like a fish out of water is just in a mismatched environment. There's nothing wrong with the fish. It's just in a mismatched environment. It can't be breathe or do any of its fish stuff because it's not in the water, right? Um, but, you know, pretty pretty soon uh, that uh, fish is going to start to suffer from an oxygen deprived brain, right? And there's going to, you know, be the beginnings of, of brain damage for the fish. Um, and then you have kind of like, it's in a mismatched environment and that's currently causing a dysfunction. Um, at that point, you could put the fish back in the water, um, but you know probably the damage is done at that point, and you'd have a brain damaged fish back in the water, and then you'd have a, a mismatch being a more distal cause uh, of a dysfunction. This is going to be important, <laughs> I promise. Um, so um, somatic mismatches is basically just the internal body analog of um, of, of like environmental mismatches, right? So if you reflect a little bit on the phenomenon of environmental mismatches, that kind of reveals to you that they're possible because of these intricate of all dependence relations between our bodies and the environments to which we are adapted. And it seems like the same is true for individual traits within our bodies, right? Um, there are these intricate evolved dependence relations between, um, between evolved traits within the body um, and, and the somatic environment to which, to which these traits are adapted, which is composed of other functional traits. Um, so we can just take kind of our analysis of environmental mismatches in general and apply it to the internal environment within the body. And that's that's what I mean by somatic mismatch. There are really two kinds of somatic mismatches um, because there are two ways in which a um, um, in which a trait can kind of operate abnormally or not ideally um, whilst still not being dysfunctional. So uh, one is uh, what I'm calling fuel failure. So um, fuel failure basically occurs when um, there is a dysfunction in some trait within the body, and that dysfunction is causing some other trait to not be able to perform its proximate function, its most proximate function. So basically this occurs where some trait T1 depends on some trait T2 for the performance of its most proximate function. So for example, suppose the heart is um, dysfunctional, um, and therefore the brain is not receiving enough oxygen and therefore you just can't think, right? So, so if, we, if we imagine that thinking is the proximate function of the brain, this looks like a case where the brain is not dysfunctional yet. Um, it just lacks a precondition for, to poor performing one of its proximate functions. So it's in a state of what I'm calling fuel failure. Um, I suppose that we have something else, which is signal failure. Um, and it's it's um, the difference between the two is that signal failure is compatible with the trait performing its uh, most proximate function, um, but the trait is failing in some it's performing its proximate function in such a way that it's it's failing to yield some more distal selected effects, some other things that it normally did in in the environment um, to which it is adapted. Um, so this really occurs where uh, the most proximate function of the trait in question is. A response function. So it's a function that has as its function to do something in response to some input from something else, in this case, another trait within the body, right? So um, it occurs where there's a dysfunction in some trait that is a signal. So that usually provides some signal to some other trait, uh, which has as its function to respond in proportion or in response to that uh, signal. So to give an example, because I know it's abstract. So for example, one of the functions of the heart um, is to regulate its rate in response to input from the vagus nerve. Now, if there's something wrong with the vagus nerve, this could lead to an abnormally low heart rate. Um, and you might look at that and think, oh, the heart is dysfunctional, but not really, right? Because the heart is performing its proximate function. 
It's just that it's it's something else has gone wrong. There's a problem with something that's signaling signaling how the heart should perform its proximate function. Um, so in this case, the heart, you know, it might not be able to do some of the things that the heart normally does, like um, contributing to circulation or supplying oxygen to tissues, but the problem is not with the heart, right? Um, the heart is in a state of signal failure. The problem is with a signal somewhere else, like the vagus nerve. Um, so this basically leads kind of to four ways, four types of sort of dependence relations for uh, ways in which a dysfunction in one trait, T2, can cause problems for some other trait, T1. And these are the sorts of uh, effects that I have in mind when I'm talking about domino dysfunctions. When I'm saying like, uh, a, you know, a, a dysfunction in a trait causes problems, this is what I have in mind. Um, so firstly, it could be that uh, T2 is dysfunctional and it's causing T1 to become somatically mismatched, but not dysfunctional yet, either because um, of fuel failure or because of signal failure. I'm not going to go over those again, but basically um, where there is uh, one of the two types of somatic mismatch. Um, or it could be that um, T2 is uh, dysfunctional and it's causing T1 to become fully dysfunctional, either because T2 is part of T1. So think about the, the uh, circulatory system, right? So if there's a problem with the heart, right, and uh, the heart is dysfunctional, it might be that like it's not possible for the system of blood circulation to do any kind of uh, circulating of blood, right? And that would be a dysfunction at a sort of higher level that's caused by um, a dysfunction in the heart at a lower level. So that's what I have in mind. So sometimes when, when a, and a trait is part of a larger trait, it can bring down the whole trait by being dysfunctional. And that's a kind of, uh, that's a kind of uh, sort of domino effect. Um, or it could be that the somatic mismatch, um, you know, that a trait is somatically mismatched as in, uh, as in A, and that's causing a dysfunction over time. So think about the fish again, <laughs> the fish out of water, right? Being in a mismatched environment, you know, it might not be a dysfunction in and of itself, but it can cause a dysfunction over time because being in a mismatched environment either means, you know, you're lacking some, some fuel, you know, that you need and that will kind of damage you over time because you don't have that fuel or it's causing some kind of stress on the organ, well, on the organ or traits that would over time uh, lead to it becoming fully dysfunctional. Um, so this is what I have in mind precisely. Um, Okay, so basically this is just a summary of what I said. So I take it that biological dysfunctions is the failure and ability of some trait T to perform its most proximate function for reasons of internal constitution. Um, and that domino dysfunctions are biological dysfunctions which either cause other traits of the organism's body to become mismatched or cause other traits of the organism's body to become dysfunctional or both. And I think that pathological conditions are domino dysfunctions. Okay, so um, at this point, I just want to like, again, revisit the problem cases and see whether we can come up with a good account of what's going on there using the domino theory. Um, and I think the domino theory can make sense of these cases. And I will argue that the problem cases actually kind of fall into three um, types of trivial dysfunction that we can make good sense of with the, with the domino theory. Um, and I think there are dysfunctions that occur in traits that are either spare, functionally isolated or that can be compensated for in some way. Okay, first, dysfunctions of spare traits. So sometimes the dysfunction uh, of some trait T fails to have any kind of adverse knock-on effects um, on other functional traits simply because the trait is spare. There are lots of other traits like it that could do the function. Um, so if, if one of them, uh, if one of them is, is dysfunctional, if one of them is not working, that doesn't really matter for the overall uh, functional organization of the organism. Um, this is usually when, yeah, the body depends on traits of a certain type. For example, the body certainly needs functional cells, right? Uh, but it's not depending really crucially on any token of the type. So, I mean, uh, the body doesn't depend crucially on any given cell, right? Um, so when you have a dysfunction in a spare trait, this, this need not have any kind of uh, bad adverse effects. Uh, so yeah, like examples, like a single dead cell or like a single dysfunctional kidney. Um, yeah, so the next one is dysfunctions in isolated traits. So what I mean by isolated traits is um, there are some traits that for whatever reason are not as tightly integrated into the functional kind of architecture of the body as other traits, um, meaning they don't have uh, many traits that depend on them uh, for their normal function. Um, 
And when these fail, you know, the, the sort of ramifications are local because, you know, the sort of functional uh, integration of the trait is local. So, for example, think of like the peacock's tail, right? So that's a sexually selected trait, we think. Um, and its function is basically to be, um, you know, aesthetically pleasing in the eyes of peahens, right? Um, and, uh, but it, it's not like the rest of the sort of, you know, um, organs and traits of the peacock really depend on the trait doing that for them to perform their function, right? It's not like, you know, like the peacock's heart's gonna fail if it doesn't have like a nice looking tail. Actually, the most impressive tails are often like a problem for the peacocks, right? Because they basically can't move and it's it's, it's sort of, um, it, it weighs them down if anything. Um, and it looks like a lot of sexually selected traits are gonna be in this category where they have a function and they can certainly dysfunction, they can fail to perform their function, um, but that's not gonna have a lot of problems for other traits in the body. Um, <clears throat> I also think sort of asexuality or exclusive same-sex attraction goes in this category um, that, you know, whether it is a dysfunction or not, and, and we don't know, right, but whether it is a dysfunction or not, it looks like it's not going to, it's just, it's very local, it's not going to have any kinds of effects, it's not like any other traits of the body depend on, um, depend on a me mechanism of opposite sex attraction uh, to perform their function. Um, Similarly, contraception or failure of reproductive function, infertility. Um, this one is a little bit more of a borderline case, I think, because you might think some types of infertility, you know, um, you know, occurs because there's a part that's failing uh, within the reproductive system that's causing a problem at a higher level, meaning at the level of the whole reproductive system. Um, but it's, it still looks pretty local, right? It, it looks like there's not a lot of you know, and I think that's why we think that people who are currently using contraception, we don't think of them as pathological. And I think the reason is because basically no other parts of your body depend on your reproductive system for their functioning. Um, so it's not like that's going to cause a lot of problems for you. Um, yeah. Um, so the final category, that's basically um, biological traits that can be compensated for uh, if they fail. Um, so that's, you know, even if the, if the trait in question is failing to function, is dysfunctional, um, there might be cases where other items can adequately compensate for this loss of function such that any dependent traits just remain unimpacted. So for example, um, you know, I, I'm sure you've all heard about these sort of really interesting cases of neuroplasticity, you know, where someone has like a, uh, you know, like, like a, like a, like a, you know, like it has <laughs> big parts of their brain removed, you know, um, and and still is able to basically function normally. Uh, you know, you can't, you, you know, you can't really trace that um, damage to any kind of functional loss. Um, and I think in those cases, the the right way to look at it is like, yes, you know, assuming that you know the regions that are missing are, you know, have a function, they certainly are not performing their function. So, you know, that's a case of dysfunction, but it's not like it's got any effects, right? Because there might be neuroplastic compensation in other regions um, that's that's sort of guarding against any kind of detrimental impacts that that loss of function would normally have. Um, another, uh, another example might be just like high level prosthetics. So like if you have a heart valve that's dysfunctional, uh, but it's compensated for by an artificial heart valve, um, it's not like that's going to have any effects, right? Because the loss of function is compensated for. Um, I think a little bit more controversial, um, and, and I, I don't know exactly what I think about this, but you might, there seems to be a very strong analog at least between this and like sort of the social model of disability um, that, um, you know, uh, how pathological a disability is, is very much a function of the extent to which it can be compensated for, right? Whether you have the right mobility aids or, you know, the right kind of <clears throat> access requirements in your environment and so on. Um, and I, I don't know exactly, I mean, don't know if that's just a metaphorical relationship or if there's something stronger going on here, but um, it's at least something um, uh, worth noting, I think. Um, okay, so that's basically, that's the sort of, that's the end of the sort of detailed um, account. I think there's some possible kind of implications of this view, which I think are sort of nice implications. Um, and uh, yeah, the first, which you might have sort of guessed already, is that it looks like there's, this is not a, this is not a categorical distinction, right? Like this is clearly a spectrum. Like, you know, the, you can have, um, you know, dysfunctions that cause very many problems for other traits, that cause lots of dysfunctions, lots of mismatches, and there's, there's dysfunctions which seems to cause 
you know, very few, if, if, if any, right? Um, and maybe they only cause mismatches and they don't cause dysfunctions. And it seems to me that this tracks something like clinical significance. <laughs> so like, you know, um, the dysfunctions that cause very many disruptions in other traits, in particular that cause lots of dysfunctions, you know, which in turn will cause further dysfunctions. Um, you know, that's kind of things like heart failure, like cancer, degenerative neurological conditions, autoimmune diseases, things like that, which are very serious um, and are sort of paradigm cases of pathology. Whilst towards the other end, you have things like disabilities, maybe infertility, um, you know, things that uh, that sort of maybe they cause some, they have some effects, but not, but not a lot, right? Um, and it seems to me this kind of implies this, this sort of spectrum, you know, where we, we can make distinctions sort of, um, or we at least have sort of principled reasons to say that like, you know, Huntington's disease or heart failure is kind of different in principle from infertility or the loss of a limb, right? Um, and we have sort of the basis for making that distinction. Okay. Um, also, I think there's kind of the beginnings of a, a, um, of a distinction between etiology and symptomology. So that's something you kind of, yeah, you know, see in sort of disease talk, right? That, you know, there's the etiology of the disease and then there's the symptomology or the sort of stuff that's uh, um, that not, not the thing that went wrong in particular. Um, and it looks to me like you can kind of put this in terms of the domino theory. Uh, so what I have in mind here basically is um, that uh, here's sort of a, um, a domino dysfunction um, and the domino dysfunction kind of is the etiology and it causes all these other things, right? Which are not the thing that went wrong in the first place, um, but there are kind of um, there are effects that the domino dysfunction had. So things like mismatches and dysfunctions that are the result of the original domino dysfunction. Um, so and finally, this is something that actually I presented this somewhere else, and uh, Nick Shea kind of pointed this out to me, and I think it's also a really uh, kind of nice implication. Um, so it looks like there's also, you kind of get the resources to make a distinction between pathological conditions on the one hand, and at least certain types of risk factors for pathology. Um, so, uh, you know, I said that sort of a dysfunction of a spare trait is not going to be pathological, right? So a dysfunction of a, you know, a single kidney is not going to be pathological. But it, it looks like um, what it does do is that it sort of exhausts the robustness of the system. So, um, even if it doesn't cause pathology in and of itself, it will cause the, the, the body to be more likely to become pathological in the future um, because you have uh, fewer kind of, um, you now need the one kidney that you have, right? So if you had two intact kidneys, you know, you're more robust, you can afford to lose a kidney. If you only have one intact kidney, even though you're, you're basically unaffected, right? Uh, you can't afford to lose um, another kidney. So there's a loss of robustness. You might think there's a similar thing with other types of sort of fallback mechanisms in the body, right? Because, because um, you know, um, our bodies are kind of robust, right? They, there's been selection for, you know, a little bit of resistance to damage, right? Like we can afford to lose things. We have sort of fallback mechanisms. We have spare traits. Um, but, you know, the more damage there's going to be to those, those uh, fallback mechanisms and spare traits, the more sort of um, susceptible to pathology and damage the body will be in the future. Um, yeah, and that's that's basically it. So yeah, what I um, have tried to do today is I've said that I'm sort of I'm trying to to come up with a real definition of pathology as opposed to um, a conceptual analysis. Um, I made the case that diseases are biological dysfunctions, but showed that there are some some sort of prima facie problems with this view. Um, I then kind of uh, gave you the basic idea of domino dysfunctions. That they are, you know, pathological dysfunctions that are causes or failures of function in other biological traits, um, and then try to sort of flesh out the details of that view. So, um, I said the dominant dysfunctions are dysfunctions which cause many other biological traits to become either dysfunctional or somatically mismatched, uh, and that they are opposed to trivial dysfunctions, uh, which come in kind of three varieties. So, it's dysfunctions of spare traits of isolated traits or of traits that can be compensated for. Um, and then I sort of discussed some possible implications of this view. So yeah, that's it.